Yeah, it's a little difficult to be, uh, be on at 7 o'clock in the morning. But I was there, and uh, the technology worked out pretty good. And uh, we had a, had a pretty good meeting. Um, tomorrow we're going to do the same thing, 7 o'clock until 10.30, 11, something like that tomorrow morning. And, uh, and then Friday morning, the same thing. But I was asked to convey to this church their deep appreciation, their love, their gratitude for our church reaching out to them. They love the radio station. They love the teaching. And... Um, you know, all the way out there in Turkana, where they are, nobody goes out there. There's hardly anybody that ministers out there, not, not very many missionaries. And what there are, it's probably sent by the Catholic Church or the Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists are pretty thick out in Kenya, I noticed. Uh, but anyway, so they were very appreciative of our ministry out there, um, they asked Michael uh, here a while back at the last feeding. The pastors said, how did you know to come out here? I mean, how did you know to do all of this? And we, it was just God, I guess. So anyway, uh, we're going to do another feeding again this Friday. And that'll be, um, well, it'll probably be before the conference. I imagine, because as you can see, by the time I got done, it was getting dark out there already. They're pretty close to the equator, so they have pretty much exactly seven hours of day and seven hours of night year round. It never changes for them. And so anyway, it was a joy and a blessing uh, to minister to them. Tomorrow we're going we're gonna to start, and, and I'm just going to teach them basic ideas about what the church is how the church is supposed to be run, who's, who's the authority in the church, uh, things like, you know, apostles, teaching on the apostles. Believe it or not, there are some who still, who still teach that they believe that there are living apostles now, and that's not true. The idea that the office of apostleship ended with the apostle Paul, he was the last one chosen, John was the last apostle to be alive, and, um, but there are some out there who claim apostleship, which basically means they can write their own doctrine if they want to. That's what that office means. And some of them do. And so I'm going to teach them about the office of apostles, the office of bishop, office of deacon and the elders and things like that. And just the general purpose of the church, things about the Holy Spirit that they may have questions on, things about the Bible that they may have questions on. Because it's in Kenya the way it is out here. There's a lot, there are many false prophets and many false teachers. And, you know, it's easy, if you don't know the truth, it's easy to get led astray. And so I'm just, I am, I am just overwhelmed uh, with thanksgiving to God for how he has blessed this church in that area. Can I get God's people to say amen? So take your Bible tonight. Uh, we're studying God. We're going to know God. We're going to know as much as we can about God. I tried to encourage the men this morning in Hebrews chapter 10, which is also a quotation from, I think it's the book of Psalms, where Jesus said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written to me to do thy will, O God. And the idea is if the book was important enough for Jesus to follow, then it must be important enough for us to follow. And so we're going to get our understanding of who God is and how God is, how God thinks, how God sees this world. What, what can God do or what is it that God cannot do? And of course, last Wednesday night we were looking at, uh, of course, we had our conference going on last uh, Wednesday. So I kind of changed uh, themes and taught on the Bible a little bit last Wednesday. But the Wednesday before that, we were dealing with one of the attributes of God, and that is the knowledge of God. What is it that God knows, and is there anything that God doesn't know or anything that God cannot know? And where we got to uh, the Wednesday night before last was we were getting into 
since we're dealing with the knowledge of God, let's look at the foreknowledge of God. I mean, it's one thing to understand that God knows everything that is currently going on. But the question is, does God know everything that hasn't even happened yet? And I believe the Bible teaches that he does. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll ask God to bless our service tonight. And uh, remember, we'll have our prayer time here in a little bit. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing now tonight upon your word. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you guide us and that you teach us, Father, your, your nature, your character. Father, we love you because of what we know about you already. And Father, even from the most simple-minded person, someone who just doesn't know very much Bible at all, the one thing that they know about you is your love for your people, your mercy, your ability to forgive us as sinners for the things that we've done. And Father, that's what we know about you, and we thank you for it. Father, I pray that you'd bless the pastors out in Turkana, bless those in Samburu, and bless the ministry of our radio station and our streaming ministry, and bless all the people that have joined with us each and every week online. And we pray, dear God, that you would visit with them tonight, teach them as you teach us. And Father, it's a joy. It is a joy to go through this book and get to know you. Lord, I was blessed just studying the church from your Bible, just knowing why you made the church, why you built the church and what it's for. Father, I learned some things I didn't even know and I thank you for that. So Father, I'm ready to learn and I pray dear God that all of you people are ready to learn tonight and we thank you God that you're always ready to teach us. Teach us great and mighty things that we know not. Bless us, bless our families, bless our church, we pray. In Jesus' name, all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, let me go to, uh, let's see here. Yeah, let's start here in Psalm chapter 139. If you want to turn your Bible to these places, I'll, of course, I'm going to have them on the screen. Uh, but it'll, if you want to try to keep up, I'm going to try to move through some of this. Psalm 139 verse 1, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. That's something that is important to know about God that relates to you as an individual is that God not only knows everything about every part of the universe and all of his creation, God knows everything that there is to know about each one of us. God knows, he says, my down sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. And when you think about how far away heaven is from us here, and yet God's knowledge stretches all the way across the vastness of the universe and reaches into our brain, and God knows all of our thoughts. That was displayed by Jesus when the Pharisees and the religious people of the day would come and they would try to trick Jesus into saying some kind of false doctrine. They'd try to trip him up all the time. And Jesus, the Bible said, Jesus knew their thoughts. How can he do that? He's God. And so once again, the attribute that's given to God the same attribute belongs to Jesus Christ. God knows you. He searched you out. God's got you figured out. He knows you. He searched you. Now, my down seating, mine uprising, thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. So therefore... It falls on God to be the righteous judge of us all. For there's not a word in my tongue, David said. There's not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain to it. David's trying to think Deep thoughts about God and he's sitting there and he's going through his mind about how much God knows about him. And he finally comes to the conclusion and he says, I can't think no more. I've reached the end of my ability to grasp God and how much he knows about me. It's way too high. I cannot attain to it. And yet there is nothing 
that is too high for God to think about. Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord. Here it is right here. This was one of the issues that I had with Finnis Dake. Where Finnis Dake said that God didn't know everything that was going on. So he had to dispatch angels out to go and fill out a report and come back to God and tell God what was going on. And Dake wrongfully ascribed an attribute to God that said, God knows most everything, but he doesn't know everything. So he has to send angels out to find out for him. That's a lie. Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. If you did good, God saw it. If you didn't do good, God saw it. He didn't need to send angels out to spy on you. God doesn't ring up the CIA director and ask for your file. He already knows everything there is to know about you. Um, yeah, let's look at 1 Chronicles 28. Some of these verses, I'm going to kind of move through this. I want to get to the foreknowledge of God. 1 Chronicles 28, 9, Thou Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart, and with a willing mind, for the Lord searcheth all hearts, and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. So there's your double witness there about God knowing all your thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee, but if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Now, Acts chapter 2, I want you to turn there. Because we get into the New Testament, and really, the New Testament sort of gives us most of what we know about God's foreknowledge. So, um, while you're turning there, John Calvin, the father of Calvinism, basically said that God predestinated those who he wanted to be saved. They were already saved. In other words, the, the doctrine of predestination, according to Calvin, was that God had already selected various people to be saved. And Christ died only for those people. And when I think about that, I don't agree with it in those terms. Because the question then is, do we not have free will to choose what, who we want to serve? I mean, the whole point of a man by the name of Benjamin Randall, who was uh, a Bible preacher from New Hampshire... And he was in with some Calvinists up there, some of the early churches in America. Their doctrine was Calvinism, the Puritan, Puritanism and Calvinism. And Benjamin Randall started studying the scriptures. And he concluded from the scriptures that Calvinism in, in that way, in that point, was in error. Because it excluded the idea of free will. And so... The majority of what they would call Baptist churches at that time were Calvinistic Baptist churches. And Benjamin Randall said, I don't believe it. In fact, they had a meeting with him and they asked him, why are you not teaching Calvinism? And he simply said, because I don't believe it. I don't think the Bible teaches that. And so he formed what then became the very first free will Baptist church. And it was called that because... Randall believed and he taught that man does have a free will and God has given us the ability to choose whether we want to serve God or not serve God. God gave man that choice. And if you look in the Garden of Eden, there are two, you know, I've taught this hundreds of times. There are two trees in the Garden of Eden. God, you know, Joshua said, you know, choose ye this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And it's very clear in the Bible that while God offers salvation to the entire world, 
it is still their choice to make. Now, how do we reconcile? There are places in the Bible, like if I look in Ephesians chapter 1, it clearly says in verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. So the word predestinated is in the King James Bible. So how do we reconcile the idea of free will if God has already predestinated certain people to be adopted into the family of God? And what in my mind links the two together is the attribute of God called foreknowledge. So God not only knows everything that has happened in man's history. God also knows everything that is happening at this exact moment in all of the creation. God also knows what is going to happen. So God knew that you would be fanning and then smile. God knew that. I didn't. But God did. So God knows now how much tire pressure is in your tires when you go home tonight. That's how much God knows. And from this point forward, we understand from scriptures that God knows everything about everybody's future. He knows it all, Brian. So if you were God and you were going to buy a lottery ticket, which one would you buy? The winning one. And you already know that, right? So God, it wouldn't be gambling for God to do it, would it? It wouldn't be gambling for God to buy a lottery ticket. God already knows the numbers that are going to roll out. God knows all of those numbers. How does he know that? He's the most high. The higher up you get, the more you can see. And since God is the most high above everything, which also means that God knows more about the future than Satan does. Amen. How many of you believe that? Say amen. Yeah. I mean, Satan, if he would have known the future, he would have never entered into Judas Iscariot to have Jesus betrayed, to be crucified, because that itself is what defeats the kingdom of Satan. He would have never done that. But God had a way of hiding it from him so that he couldn't see it. So I want you to think about this. God, The Bible says that he's made man lower than the angels. So we can't see everything angels see, and we don't know everything angels know. And yet, the Bible teaches us that God has given us the knowledge that he has hidden from principalities and powers. In other words, God has hid his plan of salvation and the final victory at the Battle of Armageddon. God has hidden that outcome from Satan and all his devils. But he has shown us plainly. In the, I mean, you've read the end of the Bible, right? You know how it ends. We win. Satan, thank you, John. Satan doesn't know that. God won't let him see it. So he still wants to fight the battle. And all of us are going, devil, why are you even doing this? You're going to lose. You're going to get busted up. You're going to get cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. Why are you doing this? God doesn't let him see it, but God then reveals it to us. So the thing that hooks predestination in with free will is God's foreknowledge. Acts 2.22, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourself also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now, I think it was the Reverend Sun Myung Moon of the Unification Church, the Mooney cult, that said that Jesus, when he was sent to earth, failed to do God's will. That's why he ended up being crucified at Calvary. He said 
that Jesus should have never been crucified, that that was a failure in God's plan. And so God sent the Reverend some young moon to accomplish the task that Jesus. Fa- I know, Lindy, it's stupid. OK, but he got a lot of people believing him and he got a lot of money out of him, too. OK, and just unhook the train a little bit. Back several years ago, the Reverend Moon and his Unification Church, through various channels, was funneling money into Christian ministries in America. Big name Christian ministries in America to try to influence them. And one of them was Jerry Falwell's group. True fact. Okay, that's my conspiracy part of me coming out. But anyway, so that's what the Reverend Moon said, that Jesus failed. But God, knowing the outcome of when he, when he sent Jesus, he knew it and Jesus knew it. Because remember, Jesus said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written to me to do thy will, O God. So Jesus knew what was going to happen. God knew what was going to happen. And that's why God sent his son, Jesus. It was because of the foreknowledge of God. No, there was nothing about Calvary that took God by surprise. Romans chapter 8, turn there. Romans 8. Verse 27. We have, oh, here it is. He's going to link it together. He's going to show you in Romans 8 the connection between predestination and foreknowledge. In fact, he's going to say both in the same sentence. Romans 8, 27. He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things, in fact, here's this verse. You know this verse, don't you? All things, say it with me. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Somebody say amen to that. So is the Bible right here? Is the Bible right in saying that? So you're having a lousy time in life. Doesn't look like things are going your way. And you're worried about the outcome. I understand that. I worry a lot about people, about things. I worry. Because I don't know everything God knows. But I am guaranteed an absolute promise that God will make all things work together for good. He always has, and he always will. So verse 29, for here it is right here. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. There it is right there. So, Pick on Cubby for a minute. Cubby, God knew all the stupid things that you not only did, but he knew them before you did them. Right? Marrying Cindy wasn't one of them. Amen? That was a good thing, right? But God knew about it. And God, I want you to think about this. God decided to call you anyway and to save you does God know all the sins we committed yes does God know all the sins we're going to commit yes and he chose to call us anyway because God knows something about you that in every choice you make the sum of all your choices in life, at the end of your life, you will have chosen Christ above all else. And nothing else matters. That's who God predestinates. So since he knew, what year did you get saved, Sterling? Sixty. 71, okay, so God knew before you were even born that at this exact night, Glenn Rakeup and Ken Goff would come to your house 
And Ken Goff would get you in one of those headlocks. He would get people in and he would you, you he was not leaving there until you prayed and got saved. I mean, that's just the way Ken Goff did it. But I mean, he was good at it. OK, God knew that God. And so God then had already prepared a plan for your life to cause you to conform to the image of Jesus Christ because he knew before the foundation of the world the outcome of every choice you would ever make in your life. That's a big God. That's a smart God. But that's how God then predestinates. He does it by way of his foreknowledge. Verse 30, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, Reg Kelly was here preaching one year, and he brought something to my attention I never thought about before, but he's true. Look at that verse again. Look at verse 30. It says, whom he did predestinate, which is a future act, them he called, which is a past tense verb. He already called them. And then he said, and whom he called, them he also justified, which is also past tense. Meaning, God has already justified you for the whole remainder of your life. You're still just as if I'd never sinned. Because God knows that every time you do sin, he's going to chasten you about it. You're going to be sorry for it. You're going to turn it over to God. You're going to repent and we're going to move on. God knows that about you. He knows he can do that with you. And then he says, whom he also justified, he also glorified. Past tense. The glory of God was already reckoned to you. Before the foundation of the world. But it, he did it because of his foreknowledge of you. God knew you were going to get saved. God knew I was going to go to camp one year. Give my life to the Lord on a Monday night service. God knew what sermon the preacher was going to preach. God knew then the bumpy road that I've been down through all of my life. And God knew that in everything that I did, both good and bad... God was going to continue to work in me, to justify me, to call me, and to glorify me. And it's already been done because the Bible says that our names are written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Already written down. Your reservation was already made because God knew every choice you would make. Everything. That's God's knowledge. Romans 11. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite, the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Did God choose Abraham in vain? Did God call Isaac even when, um, when Isaac was born? Did God call Isaac in vain when Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau? Did God make a mistake in choosing Jacob when he should have chose Esau? I mean, the Bible says clearly that before Jacob and Esau were ever born, God had already chosen Jacob to be the line through which Jesus was going to come from. He already said, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And he said that before they were ever born and before they ever did anything, God already knew what they were going to do. God knew that Esau was going to forsake his birthright over a bowl of pottage. God knew that Jacob was going to go in wearing fur on his arm to pretend that Esau was there getting the blessing. God already knew that. Did I just have a light come on? Praise the Lord. I, I must be right. Amen. So, verse 2. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What, what, ye not the, what the scripture saith of Elias... How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of 
Baal. God had already, when Elijah was about ready to give up, because Jezebel was on his heels, God said, Elijah, don't worry. You think that nobody's saved, nobody's right with God, but I've already reserved 7,000 in my name. Turn to uh, Revelation chapter 7. I think there's a connection there. Revelation chapter 7. God is going to um, turn loose the four angels and the four winds on the earth. But he's going to hold back those winds until he's done something. So in Revelation 7, verse 3. Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And it gives 12,000 from each tribe. So here again, you're looking at the election of God and the predestination of God based upon the foreknowledge of God. Those whom God has justified, them, or those whom he's called, them he's justified. Those he's justified, he's glorified. And what God is doing here in Revelation 7 is that he's handpicking 12,000 Jews from each tribe of Israel because he already knows who they are and what they're going to do for him, and he is already sealing them. Now, this doctrine, I think, is important when you compare it to Let's say the Roman Catholic doctrine. The Roman Catholic Church, do you ever know on any given day that you're going to heaven? Where are my former Catholics? What'd they tell you, Mike? You hope. You hope that you hang on that you do enough good deeds at the right time when you die. Because if you don't, and what I'm saying is in Roman Catholicism, you absolutely never have any assurance at all that you're going to heaven. You don't even have any assurance how long you're going to be in purgatory. Yes. That's where the shakedown comes in. They go to your poor family, and a guy told me this here a while back. The priest, this guy died, and his sons were Catholic, and the priest went to them and shook them down for over 30 grand apiece. And one of the brothers said, I don't care where he is right now, but you're not getting a dime out of me. And I went, I don't know who this guy is, but I like him. But see, that's, that's a money shakedown is what it is. They don't give you assurance of anything and you spend your, you can be a nun and spend your whole life praying and reading the Bible and serving God. And even as a nun, you would never get any assurance at all that you're going to heaven. Ever. Or the Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness say, Brady, Brady would have said while he was Jehovah's Witness, in fact, he told me this, I know that I'm not ever going to be one of the 144,000. So the best that I can hope for is to do enough works here on this earth so that I could get a chance to live on the earth for eternity as opposed to being the 144,000 to live in heaven. He already, he said, I've already, I already know I'm not going to be the 144,000 because I'm not good enough. They've already been chosen. So I'm automatically out. I'm going, what hope is that? What promise is that? So here's the thing. If you know, if you know tonight that you are born again and that when God calls his role, your name is going to be on it, that knowledge comes to you, not from some pride that you have, but that knowledge comes to you by way of God's spirit telling you I know you're saved, and I want you to know you're saved. Can somebody say amen? amen. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, Peter, Peter's the one that really sort of takes the reins on 
the election and the foreknowledge. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. There he says it, no uncertain terms, that the election is based upon God's knowing you. The foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience. Now, here's something about God's foreknowledge. Where he says, sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. What God knows about you is that God knows you will be obedient to his word. It's not that he selects you, gives you this salvation thing, and then you can go and live whatever lifestyle you want to live. It doesn't matter because you cannot shake off your salvation. You've got it no matter what you turn out to be. That's not it. What is it is that God knows that consistently you choose to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and believe his word. So that's his, he, when God foreknows you and he elects you, he sanctifies you, he sanctifies you unto obedience. Now Ephesians chapter 1, turn there. Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll, we'll deal with this and then we'll go into our prayer time. Ephesians 1, verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Uh, let me stop right here. I, I like, or I used to like a lot, I used to like science fiction. And part of science fiction, who's my sci-fi people? Sci-fi, okay? I'm going to get in trouble. Somebody's going to nail me for making that gesture. But anyway... Part of science fiction, there's always some guy that speculates about time travel, right? And there's always a time machine where somebody can go into the future and do something into the future, or somebody can go into the past and change something out of the past. And it's called, they call it the butterfly effect. That if you go back, uh, let's say, 6,000 years ago, a butterfly flaps its wings and the result of that air movement is that it grows and becomes a hurricane and takes out 6,000 people or 100,000 people and that's part of history. So if you go back and happen to step on that butterfly before he flaps his wings, then that six million people won't die and it's upset the whole fabric of reality, right? And we're already, you, believe it or not, there's guys on the internet who say that's happened and they know it because the Baron Stain Bears are really the Baron Steen Bears. Mandela effect. And it's called that because Nelson Mandela died in prison. No, he didn't. But some people say, well, yeah, Man Nelson Mandela, I specifically remember Nelson Mandela died in prison. But if you look at history, Nelson Mandela was released from prison, ended up becoming the prime minister of South Africa. And they say, whoa, no, I remember he died in prison. So they developed this theory that somebody out at the Large Hadron Collider flipped a switch, went into a time machine, went back and kept Nelson Mandela from killing himself. So, he, so it alters the future. So now we're in an alternate timeline, but we have a knowledge of the other timeline that we used to be in. And so, and I'm just going, okay, if stupid people want to believe that, that's fine. But then they started saying, David, that the King James Bible changed words. Because somebody said, Linda, somebody said that somebody went back in time and changed words in the King James Bible because they specifically remember that Jesus said you cannot put new wine into old wineskins. But that's not what the King James said. The NIV says that, but not the King James. King James never said that. It said bottles. So I read up on this and people are stomping their foot saying, 
Bottles weren't even invented when Jesus was around, which is stupid. There are bottles in museums from ancient Egypt 4,000 years ago. Jesus knew what a bottle was. So they're saying that the King James Bible had words changed in it. And so there's actually a group of people who are working together to come up with the alternative King James Bible with the restored words from the real timeline. Scott Johnson's leading the charge on it. I'm not making this up. They're making it up, but I'm not making it up. So here's my point in all this. If God swore that his word was incorruptible, that means nobody went in no time machine and never changed no word, no time. And if you try to figure out all my double negatives in there, what I said was the Bible's still the Bible. Amen. God's already got it seen. He's already seen. It. He's already figured it out. Now, I do have a theory. In, in the book of Daniel, it says that the beast is going to seek to change times and laws. And it will be given into his hand. Now, I'm not exactly sure what that means. So I'm going to wait until God does it, and then I'll go, yeah, I was wrong about that. But does it not mean that the Antichrist will actually try to change the past to alter the future? So what if Satan figures out that killing Jesus means that he's doomed so he tries to figure out a way to go back in time and not kill Jesus. Anyway, God's got it all right here. Don't worry about if somebody can change time. If God's written your name in the book of life, it's there. And it's always been there. And it will always be there. Amen.